All right. Um, so Fourier transform um, spectroscopy. Fourier transform is basically it's a it's a really cool mathematical technique where it effectively is a way to take a bunch of waves that are superimposed on top of each other and turn them into separate waves. Um, and so basically it's a mathematical technique that basically allows you to undo all of that constructive and destructive interference. So it's actually how FM radio works and, and AM radio for that matter. It's the radio does a Fourier transform on the radio waves that come in and turns it back into regular radio waves and sound waves. Um, and so a Fourier transform when it comes to um, spectroscopy basically allows you to just take a little bit of, of your sample. Got it, and then undo it immediately. There we go. So basically, the way the traditional IR worked um, is you would take your sample and you would put it in between in a little tiny hole in between two pieces of quartz. Um, and actually, it wasn't even usually quartz. Basically, you had to pick a material that was transparent um, but that also wouldn't absorb any IR light. And so quartz doesn't even do a decent job of that. And so it's actually usually salt crystals, uh, potassium bromide crystals. Uh, and they just have like a little hole in the middle. You take your sample and you put it there and then you shine the IR light through this sample and then you have a detector over here. And it, so it works pretty simply. It works a lot like the spectrophotometers we use, those big beige boxes, um, except that it scans through a whole range of what, uh, wavelengths all at once rather than just doing it at one wavelength. Um, but a Fourier transform works by basically you take a little sample of your of your of your uh, unknown and you put it on top of a plate of quartz again. And then this time you shine light at an angle and it bounces through here, through the crystal, and then back and comes out the other side and hits the detector over here. And just bouncing off this interface is enough to actually have it absorb some of the light, but you wind up with it being this sort of this convoluted structure where they're kind of all, all overlapping. So you need to take this signal that you get and do a Fourier transform to turn it back into separate waves to actually get the spectrum that you see. So basically the Fourier transform IR, FTIR, is just a much simpler and more efficient way of taking an IR spectrum, but the spectrum that you get at the end is the same spectrum that you would get any other way. Um, it's just a matter of, of making this part more efficient. And it means you need less of it too. It takes one tiny little crystal and it means you can do it of a solid too. You can just take a solid and put it right there. And they have this, this sort of device that kind of looks like a, a nail presser. If you've seen those those things for seating finishing nails it looks like kind of like a chisel with a little flat spot on the end and you use it to hit nails deep into the wood without damaging the wood. You use something that's kind of like that as a vice that kind of pushes down against the solid that kind of compacts it. And that's enough to do that too. So it allows you to do it just with the liquid um, or with a solid and you just put it right on top of your, your instrument rather than having to build this. I think we probably still have a few of those um, salt crystal plates there in this like kind of like clamp setup and there's just like one tiny little hole in the middle that you have to fill pretty exactly or else it doesn't you get air in there and it messes with things um, so it's just basically the new school way of doing things is to do an FTA a Fourier transform system rather than a um, traditional absorption spectroscopy um, and then Nikki you and I talked a little bit about aromatic rings in IR but just for everybody else and for the recording, there's not really a good smoking gun when it comes to IR or for aromatic rings on IR spectroscopy. Um, with NMR, it's really obvious when you have when you have an aromatic ring. With IR, it's a little bit trickier, and it's one of those things like, well, I know I have sp2 carbon hydrogens, 
I don't know if it's an aromatic ring or not because the aromatic ring stretches and bends are buried in the in the fingerprint region, really. Um, and so you can kind of like, well, with this formula and having sp2 carbon hydrogens, it's probably an aromatic ring. But you kind of have to just try and sit and and say, okay, well, can, is there another way I can draw this that has sp2 carbon hydrogens without an aromatic ring? Um, and sometimes you will be able to do that, so you're not going to be able to pull out or definitively say one way or the other. Sometimes if you get lucky, um, there is no way to draw it that fits all your criteria without an aromatic ring. Um, but it's, you know, that's one of the tricky things about this instrumental analysis is very rarely do you get a smoking gun, like definitive proof this is 100% absolutely this functional group. OH groups are a good example, are, are kind of the opposite. OH groups, you do get a smoking gun usually, um, and carbonyls for that matter, but you can't tell really what kind of carbonyl, and there's all these other variables that go into it. So it's just sort of like, okay, this is my best guess. You can be pretty confident about your best guess, but there's usually still some uncertainty as well, um, which again, if you're coming from a, from a more math heavy background, um, that doesn't feel good to have uncertainty, right? If you're used to taking your math class or gen chem, you're like, oh, no, I know. I know this is right. Um, and you're not going to get that kind of certainty in OCHEM labs a lot of the time, which is frustrating. Um, but just know that that's kind of the way, the way this class goes at first until you develop a lot more experience with it. And then, Rob, you asked about elimination re reactions occurring in basic condition. Um, are there, is there reverse reaction as well? Absolutely. It seems like it'd be really hard to go backwards once they're split up and it's in a, a basic condition. There are, and so, so addition reactions can typically work best under acidic conditions, but they can occur under basic conditions as well. So when we get to reactions of alkenes, we'll spend a whole bunch of time talking about addition reactions. But an addition reaction is effectively the opposite of an elimination. Um, and we can actually get it to go one way versus the other by um, making use of entropy. Because if we do an elimination reaction, so let's say we started with just bromo, one bromopropane, um, and it goes through an elimination reaction, and we wind up with propene plus HBr. Well, the biggest difference about between these two reaction or um, products versus the reactants is we have everything, the same number of atoms on both sides, but on the left hand side, the reactant side, it's all as one molecule versus we have two separate molecules on the right hand side. So, which did there that tells us that there's going to be a difference in entropy between the products and the reactants, right? Enthalpy-wise, it might favor one side versus the other. Usually, sigma bonds are more stable than, than uh, pi bonds. So enthalpy-wise, this would be usually be favored under at equilibrium. But this side is favored by entropy. And since we have our equation for de depend or determining whether something is spontaneous and how spontaneous it is has this T delta S term. This is where this comes into play. We've been, we've been talking about how it's favorable under high conditions or high temperature versus low temperature. This is where this comes into play because you've got one side favored by enthalpy, but one side favored by entropy. And at high temperatures, you're almost always going to favor the higher entropy side. And at low temperatures, you this term gets smaller and delta H is more important. So it becomes a case of we can we can adjust the equilibrium by changing the temperature to change which side is more favored. Um, but more on that when we get closer to it. But that's why we spent so much time on that topic, is because this is a really classic example of that. So as the temperature changes, the, the proportion will like continue yeah. to change. Yeah, the ratio between them. Okay. Exactly. 
All right, so we're going to start talking about, about NMR today um, to get this on the recording because today's today's lab, we're going to finish up this the steam distillation, but we're also going to do um, CO2, liquid CO2 extraction of, of um, the essential oils. Um, and then we're going to, I'm going to give you the NMR spectra for the two products, for the eugenol and the limonene. And you'll have to analyze those too. And when you put those together with the IR, that's how you get your smoking gun and get a really a large degree of certainty. Um, or at least like, I know it's down, it has to be one of these three structures that I drew. Um, and typically those three structures are gonna be really close to each other. Usually it's like, oh, is the double bond between two and three or three and four? Is that's like, that's the level of uncertainty. Everything else about the molecule might be the same. Um, so NMR is a little trickier conceptually, but it, it's a little bit more systematic way we analyze it, which is kind of nice. Um, basically, it turns out that that we talked about we talked about electrons as having spin a lot, right? Turns out that any I always mix these two up because I'm not a theoretical physicist. Um, any fermion, a fermion. No, that's backwards. Let's let's make sure I get this right. So if you've heard of the Higgs boson, um, bosons and fermions are basically, I guess they're like hadrons as well, but for the most part, we care about fermions and bosons. And so bosons, fundamental particles that have a spin integer um, or have integer values of spin. So if your spin values add up to zero, it does, then it's a boson. And bosons don't have a magnetic field. Fermions, I was right. Fermions have a spin that's half integer. And so that's like an electron, right? Electrons have half integer spin. Um, but it turns out also that protons and neutrons have half integer spin as well. And they tend to always arrange themselves such that they get as close as possible to zero overall spin. But if you have an odd number of nucleons, then your spin's going to have to be either plus one half or minus one half, right? Um, and we're used to, like I said, we're used to thinking about electrons having spin, but the fact that, that the nuclei can also have spin means that they also are influenced by a magnetic field. Um, so electrons don't really show up in NMR spectroscopy because when we're dealing with stable molecules, we always have even number of electrons, right? Which means zero spin overall. But the nuclei, as long as we have an odd number of nucleons, will also respond to a magnetic field. All right, and so, and again, the this is one of the reasons why we call it spin, even though they're not physically spinning, is because these fermions that have an odd number of nucleons, um, they create a magnetic field that looks like what you would get if you took a charged particle and you rotated it. If you take, if you rotate a charged particle, it generates this magnetic field um, that looks a lot like a bar magnet, where you've got you've got the north end of the magnet and the south end of the magnet. In, and that means that we can actually make our nuclei all line up with their magnetic fields pointed the same direction if we do it carefully. All right, and so if you put a, a fermion in a very strong magnetic field, you actually wind up with two different ways it can arrange itself. If you think of the way that you could arrange um, a bar magnet like this in between two stronger magnets, you can either have it aligned so that it goes with the magnetic field, or you can have it flipped 180 degrees. If it's flipped 180 degrees, it's going to spontaneously try to flip back the other way, though. Everybody's tried taking a magnet, forcing it onto another magnet the wrong way. And then what happens is your finger slips and it flips back the other way, right? That's what NMR spectroscopy is, is measuring 
that flip back the other way. So by putting these, these anything with an odd number of nucleons into the strong magnetic field, we create two different states for it. Pointed, the lower energy one's pointed with the magnetic field. The higher energy one is pointed against the magnetic field. And we basically, we hold it in this really strong magnetic fields until everything is aligned in the lowest possible energy state. And then what happens is we start shining light on it. And we, we measure how much light gets absorbed, a lot like IR spectroscopy, except at a different wavelengths now. Now we make sure that our wavelengths are such that it, instead of absorbing it due to vibrations, it can bump it to the higher energy level. Basically, we hit it with the light to get it to flip the wrong way to the magnetic field. And then when it flips back the other way, it gives off light. And we measure the light that it gives off. And that tells us basically what wavelengths of light or what that energy gap is and what wavelengths of light can be absorbed. All right, so in our average, let's, let's just think about a really simple molecule for starters here. Let's go back to, we'll use propane. Now, this whole strategy only works when we have an odd number of nucleons in a nucleus. If it's something as simple as just carbons and hydrogens, what do we have that has an odd number of nucleons? Well, so, and sorry, I guess I should, I need to specify. Um, each individual nucleus needs to be an odd number for it to show up. So carbon on, on usually the carbon isotope we're looking at is carbon 12, right? That's our most common carbon isotope. So carbon 12 won't show up in an NMR. Carbon 13. Carbon 13 does. We'll get to that. But what's what's the other possible one in here? Hydrogen. So the simplest NMR is called proton NMR and it's hydrogen NMR because basically it can tell us everything about all the different types of hydrogens in this molecule. All right, so, and this is just a, a diagram showing what happens in the absence of a magnetic field, everything just sort of randomly arranges. If you put it in a strong magnetic field, everything arranges either to be in the low energy alpha state or in the high energy beta state. What causes them to do alpha over beta? Um, probability. If you make it so it has to flip one way or the other, most of them are going to arrange themselves to be in the alpha state. Some just by sheer odds. Equilibrium and Boltzmann distribution will flip to be in the beta state. Um, and then we can force them to flip into the beta state by shining light on. Once we're satisfied that almost everything is in the alpha state, then we shine light on it and get to flip to the beta state. And when it flips back, it gives off light. And that's what we actually measure. And this is, and again, I, I think I mentioned this is the same technique and the same. Um, logic that gets used with that makes MRI possible. We do this on the scale of an entire body and then shine really low energy light to get it to flip between the alpha state and the beta state. And then you do stuff like a Fourier transform and you do some computer modeling, you get an MRI scan. Um, if you do it at the scale of a single molecule, we're just looking at individual protons now. MRI looks at like the water molecules. Is that like the hydrogen? It's the hydrogen in the water molecules specifically. Um, and that's why a lot of times you can do other versions of MRI involve doing things like being injected with specific radioisotopes. Sometimes that's because you want to put an isotope that has an odd number of nucleons in a specific place. Um, Sometimes it's also just because we can, you know, use a glorified Geiger counter and follow the radiation through your body. Um, but it, for the most part, it has to do with 
um, with making sure you have something with a significant number of odd nucleons. All right, so here's the overall process. So magnetic field off. So the, the pink arrows here represent the spin um, spatially where things are pointed. So magnetic field off, everything's random. Magnetic field on, everything lines up into the alpha state, the low energy state. Turn on your radio waves. And so radio waves, are, that is light, right? Just with the low energy light. And you get, and you basically shine light on it until you can be pretty sure that you put everything into the beta state. Then you turn the radio transmitter off, and as they switch back to the alpha state, as they fall down to the lower energy state, they give off light. And then once that's all done, when you've measured all the light that's been given off, you can just turn the magnetic field off, and everything goes back to being random. Um, this is also one of the reasons why if we have everything if naturally we will have some distribution of alphas and betas, if we want to make sure everything starts as alpha, that means we want to make sure that we have a, um, as few molecules as possible can go through that transition state to go from the alpha to the beta, right? And remember that that Boltzmann distribution that looked like this, if this is the cutoff, for, half, for flipping between alpha and beta states. If we want everything to stay in, in the alpha state until we let it go, we want it to be as cold as possible because the colder we can get it, the more we can get it to look like this instead. The less random chance we have where they, some of them are still in beta state. So the best NMR and the best MRI for that matter, um, but especially NMR, if we do this at liquid nitrogen temperatures, we can get it really, really cold. And we can say, okay, everything is in the alpha state or close to everything, which means we get very little noise in our spectrum. Um, the best NMR work at liquid helium temperatures, which is about four Kelvin, um, which is really, really dangerous to work with because it evaporates, boils off so quickly that, that if you let liquid helium hit room, anything room temperature, it'll immediately vaporize and you have rapid expansion of gas, which is another way of saying explosion. Um, so we actually have to, you have to cool down the liquid helium using liquid nitrogen. We have to cool down everything that you're going to transfer liquid helium in using liquid nitrogen. Because if you do allow it to get close to room temperature, it's a, it's a big problem. All right, so if you do it right, though, you can get a spectrum that looks a lot cleaner than an IR spectrum. We're not looking at vibrations. We're just looking at these magnetic moments. And this is a, a cleaned up spectrum. But if, you, if you're if you at liquid nitrogen temperatures, you usually can get it to be really, really flat in between your signals, which makes it really easy to see what's a signal and what's noise. Is it, so that's the light like being released. Um... Yeah, so it, it winds up being, you know, it goes through the, these mathematical transformations to actually register this because this is a really, really low intensities too. Um, and so we wind up with these, these units that don't make a whole lot of sense. Um, they just call it chemical shift. Um, and, and we'll talk about, like, it, it doesn't really track to any real value. Um, mathematically, and obviously it does, it's mathematical, it's quantitative, but nothing that we're actually going to do the math for. Basically, chemical shift represents how de-shielded a proton is, or how de-shielded a nucleus is. And when I say de-shielded, um, shielding is another way of referring to electron density. When something is de-shielded, that means it has very little electron density around it. So it's near things that are more electronegative than it is. And the further, we call this downfield. And again, they, they do the same thing with NMR that they do with IR, where they count from right to left instead of left to right. Um, and again, I'm not sure why that is, but that's just always the way it's presented. Um, the further downfield you are, the more de-shielded 
your protons are. Right, so it doesn't track one to one with with something as simple as energy. That's where it comes from. Is well, what's the energy? How how well is it responding to the magnetic field? There are so many variables at play, though, that we we get the end result and we treat it not mathematically, but just sort of conceptually, because it turns out different functional groups have consistent effects on, on the proton shieldings. And so there's, we're gonna go through each of these in, a, in individually, um, but the simplest one to think about is the number of signals that you get is equal to the number of unique protons, number of distinct protons from each other. Makes sense in a, in a lot of ways, right? If we have, the, the trick is sometimes is the figuring out what's a unique proton. If we go back to propane, there are eight protons on propane. How many of them are distinct from each other? So there are three carbons, but that carbon and that carbon are identical to each other, aren't they? Which means these three protons and these three protons are energetically and chemically identical. The signal's the same. So they'd be the, they would show up as one signal. And then these two in the middle are identical to each other and they would show up as a separate signal. So basically, if you can't tell the difference when it came to numbering your carbons, you can't tell the difference between the hydrogens. So it'd, it'd be different if there was like a different functional group on one of those? Uh, yeah. First and third? If we make that an OH. Okay. Then all the other then would be now we have three peaks, right? Actually four peaks. Oh, the OH because the OH, this hydrogen is gonna have its own peak it's going to be different than these two, which is different than these two, which is different than these three. So just looking at the number of peaks, the number of signals is itself really valuable once you know how to count them. And again, we'll do practice with each of these in a second. I'm going to go through them all briefly. We already talked a little bit about shielding. So anything that's directly attached to something really electronegative like a nitrogen or an oxygen is going to be more de-shielded and it's going to show up further down the field. So that, so once you know, okay, if I'm looking at this, um, this particular spectrum that's shown as an example, this is one signal. This is one signal. And this one, is a little bit trickier to read, but we'll find out that that is very characteristic of aromatics. It's a couple aromatic hydrogens on top of each other. But basically, um, when they're, even though this has several peaks built into it, that's what's called peak splitting. And that actually is gonna tell us some valuable information. Um, but the, the fact that there's like very clearly a separate signal here and then you might notice these other peaks are vaguely um, bell curve shaped they're vaguely shaped like a gaussian distribution and this one looks a lot more random if it looks a lot more random usually that tells us that's a couple signals on top of each other The area under each peak, the height of each peak, just like with IR, you can't read too much into the height of each peak, I guess, and GC for that matter. Um, but just like GC, the area under the curve, the integral, is really valuable. The integral is proportion to the, proportional to the number of protons in that signal. Mm -hmm. Going back to the one farthest down, mm -hmm. if one of those peak lines, like in the middle, go all the way down, like to like where the baseline is, would you separate them, or was that still be like a cluster of one peak? It's 
it gets tricky and it's one of those like well i don't know that and that's that's where the integral winds up being really helpful um so let's go to a i'm going to make make up a actually heh. I know what that other molecule is on the top of my head now because I just thought about how I would draw things. So I can use this one. Um, if we looked at all of these peaks and we looked at it, a lot of times we, we represent the integral by just drawing a line that kind of looks like an integral symbol. And the height of the line is, is representative of the total amount of area under there. And let's see. So I didn't do it perfectly to scale. If you're doing this um, on a computer program, you can actually say, okay, my signal starts here and ends here, and it'll actually go through and do the integration for you. Um, one. 1.5 and 2.5. So the way it usually works is whatever your smallest integral is, you don't know that that's actually one, that that's one proton. But what you do is you look at all the rest of the integrals and put them relative to that smallest integral. So we don't know that that's a one, but we know that that's the smallest integral. And we know that this is one and a half times the size. And since, uh, so you, because you can't have half of a proton, what do we actually have here? It's not one, one and a half, and two and a half. It's what? Three, two, three. Three, right, so two, three, three and five. five. So now all of a sudden, that actually kind of, to go back to your question about, well, how do we, what do we do with this? Like, well, I don't know how many distinct signals I have in there, but I know that there's five protons and it's in the area where an aromatic ring shows up. So if there's five protons on an aromatic ring, that tells you a lot about it. It doesn't really matter how many signals there are that you know what all five of those protons are. They're the protons that go around the benzene ring. So with that in mind, if we had an integral of five here, we know it's an aromatic ring with only one thing attached to it, right? That's what I have written as the R group. So how many signals is that? How many distinct hydrogens are on the benzene ring? Can you tell the difference between these two? Or these two. So that's one signal. That's one signal. That's one signal. So it's three signals on top of each other. But because they all show up in the benzene ring region, and the integral said that there's five of them, that tells us everything we need to know. Adjacent three different signals. Um, the fact that you could be adjacent to the R group, or you can be one removed from the R group, or you can be opposite from the R group. So if we took this molecule and we flipped it over, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between that hydrogen and this hydrogen. For the shielding, is that related to like uh, how polar the bonds are? Yeah. Okay. That's what yeah, so that electronegativity, that pulling the electrons away from the hydrogen. In an organic molecule, hydrogen's less electronegative than pretty much everything, right? So that means that hydrogen's always deshielded to some extent. It's just, is it attached to a carbon? Is it attached to an oxygen? Is it attached to a carbon that is itself attached to an oxygen? Basically, how close is it to something like a chlorine or an oxygen that's really electronegative is going to determine how we shield it is. And just like with the IR, we basically have tables to say, okay, if it's in this region, it's this type of proton. And okay, so, I wouldn't expect you to be able to do all of this at this point, right? I'm walking you through why all of these pieces are important because like you pointed out, Nikki, we can't tell how many signals that is 
on its own without also having the integral and also knowing something about the shielding. All right, and so, and the last piece is, is to me was always the trickiest to understand conceptually. Um, my wife disagrees with me. She thought that this was, this is like the one thing she remembers about OCHEM is peak splitting and NMR. Um, but basically, the number of peaks, this is all one signal. So if everything was perfect, this would show up as one bell curve, one peak. But if you take that and you put it next to other hydrogens that are attached to an adjacent carbon, that actually, those generate their own tiny little magnetic fields, right? So the whole molecules, the, the, all the nuclei might be lined up so that their spin faces with the magnetic field, but there's this internal magnetic fields within the same molecule. That, so those protons can flip back and forth relative to the rest of the molecule. And so the peak splitting on each individual signal tells you how many nearest neighbors a proton has. It doesn't tell you how many protons are attached to the same carbon. That's the integral. The peak splitting tells you how many hydrogens are attached to the carbons next door. And so I wanted to say that so you heard it once so that when, because it won't make sense the first time, but when we come back to it, um, there's a, there's a good reason for that. All right. So here's just the, the slides going through what we kind of talked about already. More downfield means more de-shielded and certain functional groups, groups show up in certain ranges. And so we just have tables say, okay, if it shows up in this range, it's one of these functional groups. Um, and you notice this has a shifted um, x-axis here, where the other one, the one we were just looking at stopped at like nine, but there are a few functional groups that'll show up way down the field. Carboxylic acids and aldehydes in particular, which kind of makes sense. Those make sense that those would be the most de-shielded, right? This hydrogen here on a carboxylic acid is directly attached to an oxygen that is directly attached to a carbon that has another oxygen attached to it. There's a lot of electron density pulled away from that. And aldehydes is very similar. It's not directly attached to the oxygen. The fact that the carbon and the oxygen have that high bond means it's very de-shielded. Alcohols, interestingly enough, because of all the lone pairs around that, in fact, that's all sigma bonds are not as de-shielded as you might think. Um, but don't try to read too much into it. Just know that basically you would go through when you get your NMR spectrum, you would go through and say, okay, in this, this particular region here are my possibilities for what that signal is. And a lot of times the, integ the integral will actually solve that for you, right? Because if your integral says that your peak has, that you have three protons in that signal, but you only have one oxygen, you know, you can't have three alcohols if you only have one oxygen, right? And so sometimes the molecular formula will inform this a little bit as well. And you'll be able to rule things out just based on the fact I don't have that many oxygens. All right, so for this one, we have peaks between one and three, um, just above one, just downfield from one and just, and downfield from two and a half. Alkyl groups seem to be most likely ones to show up there. Something benzylic, which means adjacent to a benzene ring or adjacent or in the allylic position might be, might account for that two and a half one. So with that in mind, Mary said, okay, that's a benzene ring with integral of five. We had integral of two, um, wrong abbreviation, but 
and the formula is CH10. Just right there, that's actually enough to figure out what the structure of this molecule is, right? So there is a lot more definitive information in an NMR compared to an IR. IR is really helpful because it's it's like a, a security blanket. It's gonna be the one that's most reliable. You don't need to do too much with it. NMR can be really confusing sometimes, um, but part of that is because NMR has so much information in it. So we knew that this was a benzene ring just because of where it shows up between seven and eight. We know the, how many protons we have for each of these. What's the structure that fits for this? And really just knowing the integration and the formula and knowing that there's a benzene ring is that is enough to narrow down a lot, right? Because six of your eight carbons are a benzene ring, right? So if six of you, if you know you've got you've got a benzene ring attached to an arm, nothing else on the benzene ring because otherwise your integration wouldn't be five. What does the R group have to be? Oh, an ethyl group. Because you're going to wind up with two protons in that area, that two and a half region that, that is directly attached to a benzene ring, that benzylic range. But even not knowing that, just knowing that you have a benzene ring with only one thing attached to it, and the integral of, of the two peaks is two and three, is enough to say, okay, that means that my R group must be CH2, CH3. That peak is your CH2 protons. And the methyl group is your CH3 hydrogen. All right, we're gonna go. So this is just more, this is, this is a, a real NMR spectrum rather than this kind of cleaned up one that, that looks a little bit too perfect, with super flat line, absolutely no noise. This is what they usually look like. They usually look, look something a little bit more like this. It's still a really flat line, but there's these little bumps that show up sometimes. The, you can still kind of see the little bell curve nature, but they kind of look like in math, what they call a delta function, where it just like jumps up and then jumps straight back down. There's no slope to it. If you zoom in on these, they'll look a little bit more like that. But with the, at a standard NMR spectrum, a lot of times this is what it winds up looking at. I think you know, our computers have gotten a lot better. So they aren't quite as pixelated anymore, but it's still like a lot of data in small space. So zooming in, you get some you know, you're limited by your technology. Um, and so this is, but this is what I was talking about where we just say, okay, well, the integral of this peak relative to these other two, if it doesn't say two, three, three, it would say one, 1 1.5 and 1.5, but you know that that has to be, you can't have 0.5 of, of a proton. And the other thing is you're almost always going to know your molecular formula when you're doing this. So even if you don't know, you know, if it was a one to two ratio and you don't know if it's one to two or if it's two to four or three to six, um, the molecular formula will usually tell you that too, right? Because your total number of protons has to add up to the number of hydrogens in your sample. So if you were 
running like an analysis and on an unknown, um, would you do like mass spec first to get the formula or like? Either mass spec um, or the, the other way you can do it is you burn it and see how much CO2 you make. If you And you measure the moles of CO2, you can figure out how your molecular weight of your sample and you can work backwards that way. But yeah, usually the first thing you do, if it's a true unknown, the first thing you do is you figure out your molecular formula. And usually they do, there's a variety of ways of doing that. Mass spec is probably the most common at this point. Um, just, and you get a molecular weight, what the fragments are um, to figure out what that formula is. All right, so this is the other way of showing. So here's another real spectrum. Um, this is the other way of showing the integral is the red line is the, is the function of the integral. In terms of, in math terms, remember um, when you actually took the integral of something, if it was, if you left it as a function, it was the indefinite integral, right? The red line is basically the indefinite integral. It's a running total of the overall area under the curve. But because everything is really nice and flat in between these peaks, all you really have to do is measure the difference in height between here and here. Here and here. And sometimes literally, if you if you have this as a printout, sometimes that means literally you get a ruler out. And you measure the distance between these. And they should be some relatively nice, neat fraction of each other. Find the one that's the smallest and call that one. And then make everything else up there a um, multiple of that. And Nikki, here's another good example too of how do we know is that one is that one peak or two peaks? Well, it does look like it like. If we drew a line right there, it would be like evenly spaced that would match up with that one, right? And it's a little hard to see, but these, this is not bell curve shaped next to each other, right? That one is kind of bell curve shaped and that one's kind of bell curve shaped. But to put together, they're not bell curve shaped. And so sometimes it's a little bit tricky to know if it's two signals or one, but we can say, okay, well, if that's definitely my smallest jump, right? So we call that one. This could either be one signal that's two protons, or it could be two signals that are each one proton. Okay. So we just kind of leave it as it's one of these two options and just know that that's, you know, make a note to yourself, two signals, one signal, and then come back to it when you have some more information. Would it be the same thing for the one on the front? Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is getting into that region. This is a six and a half, which is in that aromatic region, right? So this is probably a benzene ring. The question is, is it five protons on a benzene ring or is it four protons on a benzene ring? Or is it just three protons on a benzene ring? And that's when we would look at this and say, okay, well, if that's one, that could be, and I would, I would probably literally get out a ruler Normally, that looks like it's about three times. It doesn't look like it's four times. Yeah, and so that could be three signals in there. If we had three chemically distinct protons. And again, I would want to get out a ruler to be sure. Is it closer to three or four? But that's so there's probably three protons on a benzene ring there. One, one is one in all likelihood, but it could be two that are the same. This is definitely one signal that looks bigger than this one, right? So I'd say that that's three. And that's definitely not three, and it's definitely not one, so it's two. That one's tricky to, to call as well. This one's harder, probably the hardest one to tell. And so we would, we would go through and 
And when we look at peak splitting in a, in a few minutes, the fact that these are like identical height tells me that's probably about that's probably one signal. But when we talk about peak splitting, that'll make more sense. And so without knowing anything else about this, you probably are looking at something with six, nine, and eleven protons. Including in and a benzene ring. So even without knowing the molecular formula, we know a lot about this molecule all of a sudden. Um, the other thing to keep in mind that's a little bit tricky is that there are certain cases where you can wind up with, with um, the hydrogens that are directly attached to an oxygen show up a little bit weirdly. Um, we'll give some examples of that in a minute. But all right, here's peak splitting. And we're, we'll talk about this real quick, and then we'll take a break and come back and we'll talk about it some more. All right, so remember how I said that if you if you have hydrogens attached to an adjacent carbon, they all of their magnetic fields interact with each other. But that what that means is that you can wind up with with multiple ways that they interact, but they, where they can both be in that beta position, pointed against the magnetic field. One can be with and one can be against, and there's two different ways they can do that. And then, or they can both be with the field. So basic probability wise, this means that there's actually three energetic states that are part of that same one single larger signal. And so even though there's more than one peak, a lot of times we'll call this, this is one signal with peak splitting. And the peak splitting is based on how many possible ways are there to arrange the adjacent hydrogens next to each other. And so the more hydrogens you have as a next door neighbor, the more possible orientations there are here. And so the what shows up as, in this case, we call it a triplet. Um, so we have singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, quintet, sextet. After that, you just call it a multiplet. Um, the number of peaks you see in your signal is one more than the number of adjacent hydrogens. If you have two adjacent hydrogens, it will show up as a triplet. If you have three adjacent hydrogens, it shows up as a quartet. Right, and they call that the n plus one rule. You'll see the same number of peaks as the number of adjacent hydrogens plus one. So if I go back to that ethyl benzene one that we looked at before, these hydrogens, the ones in the methyl group at the end, there were three of them, which is why the integral was three. But the peak splitting, there, it's a trip shows up as a triplet because it has two nearest neighbors. Two nearest neighbors plus one gives you a total of three peaks. These ones, there's two of them, so the integral is two, but it shows up as a quartet because it has three nearest neighbors. Three plus one is four. And this, I didn't draw a whole molecule. Um, I looked at it as that R group. And this is definitely a case of um, a place where it's helpful to draw the complete structure because we actually are, our signals are coming from the hydrogens in this case, right? So we don't want to confuse ourselves by not drawing the hydrogens. Peak splitting gets messed up when the aromatics are involved, when, when resonance is involved. And so you can't trust the peak splitting when it comes to aromatics. And it really, peak splitting is, is probably the least um, consistent piece of information we get. The integral is the integral. The integral works, period. Um, and same with the shielding. Like I so said, there's a range where they'll show up, but it's always going to be the same area. Um, 
peak splitting is tricky because when resonance is involved, you get something that looks like this. And you're not going to look at this and try and be able to tell your peaks apart or you're splitting apart. And same when you have multiple signals on top of each other, their peak splitting gets confused with that too, right? But sometimes you get stuff that's, that's so you use the peak splitting really to, if you have nice clean peak splitting, you can trust it. And it also allows you to say, well, I'm pretty sure it's this. Does the peak splitting support my argument? Use it sort of as a secondary argument rather than as your primary argument. So in this case, we say, okay, well, we're pretty sure that this is right. Does the peak splitting support that? Yeah, we've definitely got our more de-shielded protons on the, that are, have the integral of two and have three adjacent hydrogens, so we should see quartet. Right, so we kind of use put all of that together, and we do get it. If we have a nice clean spectrum like this, we can be very, very certain we have the right structure without any additional information. And we didn't even have the, the molecular formula for this. Granted, I was guiding you through this, um, and it was as I was starting to look at this spectrum when I, you know, when I figured it out for myself a few slides ago. I'm like, oh, I know what this is. I figured it out. It's because I looked at this. I'm like, oh, peak splitting. We hadn't gone over that yet. Um, but it, and it takes a long time for it to be second nature, for it to be something that you can do on the fly without the molecular formula, without sitting down and drawing a bunch of possibilities. It also helps that even if it was a few years ago that I did write these slides. Um, my memory is not great, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, the reason that it that it follows these and the reason that they look like um, a bell curve is because the number of possible orientations, number of possible combinations, is it's just a probability distribution, right? Um, you remember Pascal's triangle? Does anybody, I used to draw that, that was my doodle that I would draw on the back of the page while I was taking notes in chem classes, I would start drawing Pascal's triangle where this, each number is the sum of the two numbers above it. Um, and it winds up with this distribution that is, this is where bell curves come from. If you take this and you extend it further and further and further, you get something that looks more and more like a clean bell curve. And that's why those peak splitting, those peaks tend to be shaped like a bell curve. And that's why I think this is two different signals. Because if you look really closely, it looks like this is a bell curve. It looks like this is a quartet. And this one is, it looks like probably a, a um, what I just changed the pen a pentuplet, pentuplet, five peaks. Right? And they're not quite the same height. They're not symmetrical. Um, so all of those are part of the reason why I'm, with the with the experience and background that I have, I can I would look at that and say that's almost certainly two peaks. And why I would look at this one, say, okay, well, that looks really symmetrical, right? It looks very cleanly like it's a doublet, where there's the same shape as well. So I would look at that and say that's probably one peak. That's probably two peaks or two signals, I should say. And then over here, yeah, we, we might be able to say that we have three peaks there, three signals, which corresponds to the integral, right? If the integral said we should have five and we're looking down here and it looks like it's three, that's, there's probably something more complicated happening because they have to agree with each other. But I would definitely say oh, that looks pretty cleanly like there's three distinct signals there. And sometimes with benzene rings, you can do that. Sometimes they're also overlapped on top of each other. You can just say, I don't know what it looks like, but it's a benzene ring. All right, let's take a break. Let's come back at five after.
and we'll do some practice with the peak splitting. So we're just finishing our week. I think we're just finishing our one. It's going to be a long day because yeah. we have to finish. Well, the other one's pretty quick. We like throw it in the funnel and you just kind of like toss it around and drain out the bottom and then. But then we have to set up another like distillation yeah. bay and like let it evaporate off the salt load. And then we have to do CO2 lab today, too. Yeah. I was like, I don't know oh. how we're going to do all that. We were only able to get to like yeah. one, <laughs> like half of one. I think when Sean plans about it, he's like, oh, I can do this real fast. And then when it's yes. our time, it's our first time, it takes longer. To... Yeah, if we, like, if we repeated it, I'm sure we'd do a lot of that too. Right. Figuring out the first one takes yeah. so long. And the prep too took so long. Like cutting the lemon. <laughs> that took like so long. Let's do it again. And you have to do lemon again because you did it last time. Do I? Yeah, that's what it said. I was reading it last time. It's like, no, we gotta do you switch. I didn't say once we can compare it. <laughs> I wish I did the, uh, what was it? Was it cloves? Yeah. It's 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 yeah. Then I guess like, oh, that would be easier to do. So. Oh, yeah. Let me switch. <laughs> yeah. Back to the same smells. It's <laughs> really warm in here, isn't it? Kind of feels nice, but yeah, it's, but yeah. it's definitely not cool. Go with this because we're getting the sun right now. Still get a lot of skier accidents. We got one um, because I want to see what it looks like up there. It probably doesn't really look that good. You know what's but... so shameful is they're showing pictures. The marketing team showed pictures from last year. They're like, we're like, no, like that's, that's, that's scary. Right. It's... So they're like luring people up with like fake information and then yeah. Part of the does that happen? Yeah. Like, All their pictures, they're like showing last year's pictures. We got this one guy at like two o'clock a couple of days ago who um, was on shrooms for the first time and he couldn't. <laughs> it <would speak. laughs> it's like, I feel terrible. My back hurts really bad. Like, I don't feel it. And like, the medic's like, what, did you do anything? And he's like, well, I, uh, <laughs> so funny. Like, well, there's your problem. Yeah, <laughs> and he's from Lake Sack, too. So he like, drove up here with all his friends. And his friends are problem. Yeah. <laughs> sure, you'll be fine. Yeah, they should have just left them at the rental with a blanket. <laughs> Like, <laughs> some easy bag. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look like any sort of organizing group in nature. I went up there yesterday for work and I think we do some tests and stuff in the back of it. It was like tons of people up at Cal Mesa. Really? Like in the parking lot. Oh like, my God. Yeah, and people are so like impatient, I noticed too, because like with the ambulance, like the guy was going to pick in the middle of the parking lot. Yeah. And there's people that are like, we're trying to pull out. Can you move? <laughs> oh, so and we're like, <laughs> silent on. I hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, not that, not that significant. Yeah. And that's great. What do you, what, uh, do you guys use for your forecasts? Um, you I like the, the underground, and then I have like the ski patrol sensors for the on mountain, mm -hmm. so I can link to the nice. Yeah, well, weather underground does a decent job uh, up here at getting the snow total, at least in the recent years. The open snow is good too. There's like yeah. a meteorology like discussion like that comes out frequently, and it's more focused towards like the mountains because the weather up on the mountains is always different than down in the town. Yeah, mountains, so that's pretty good for like. For skiers. For skiers, like, yeah. oh, what's this next storm? Maybe, you know, like three days out or something like that. I'm mostly concerned with lake level at this point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah kids don't take place. Am I going to have to get the snowblower running? <laughs> yeah. 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 I think it'd be hard to top last year, especially at this okay. point. Yeah. No, I mean, I mean, there's people misunderstand the term 100 year storm, but. Hundred year winter, but that's probability of getting two of those back to back is pretty yeah. low. Like one in a thousand, right? We like wanted ten thousand, although but because we've already had one, now it's just one in a hundred. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, there's more like from a statistics point of view. Right. There's more to it than that meteorologically. Like, are we likely to repeat? Yes, the past does influence the future, but from a statistics point of view, once it's happened, then it's then it's happened and it has a probability of one. Um, but yeah, I would be very, very surprised if we got anything close. I, you know, I'm kind of banking on it. It's going to be a standard Tahoe winter. But we'll have one to do. Some slush. Yeah, we'll have some slush one day a month and yeah. then be sick of it. Uh, that's what I'm hoping, or not hoping, but I bet like everyone's going to be like holding, you know, like faith. And then by like January, it'll be done. People start doing other things and then it will start soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like that. Exactly. People give up on it. But I think part of it too is having grown up in California, not in the mountains, and then lived in the mountains and lived in the Midwest for, for a little bit of time. People, California doesn't change their plans based on weather. Oh, so it's yeah. Especially yeah. about our mountains. Like, yeah. no, I thought my VRBL, I'm going up the mountains. I don't care what the weather's like. Oh, like yeah. And then they get here and they show up at Cal Base and it's garbage yeah. or they get stuck. And, well, I was planning on coming up. What do you mean I was supposed <laughs> to change my plan? That's just yeah. not something people yeah. see. Yeah. It's so true though, about California. Yeah. yeah. I just threw a story. Like, I got reservations. I'm not going to cancel. Yeah. <laughs> It's and it's it's still weird to me. I still have to fight that sometimes because my wife would be like, "Oh, there's a lizard in Nebraska. We can't drive home today." Like, well, I bet we can. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's let's get back to NMR a little bit. So let's work it backwards for this first one, first one to try and get a handle on how this works. Um, I didn't use this term, but it was on the slide before. They call that that peak splitting. They call it the number of peaks. They call it the multiplicity. So something double it would have a multiplicity of two. Um, but and what it really comes down to is, as long as you have an idea of what the nearest neighbors are, we can predict what that should be. So the multiplicity. So you can start by just coming in here and drawing all your hydrogens. Make sure we don't forget anything. And if we're counting all the nearest neighbors, we're gonna to wanna to know, right? I probably should use a different color, but it's done. Um, so for these first two, first off, how many distinct signals are we gonna see here? How many hydrogens are chemically unique from each other. So we've got, we've got these ones. Are there any others that are identical to that? Yeah. Here's where the, the color coding will really be helpful. Are there any others where we have more than one carbon that have identical hydrogens? Very far. Same thing over here, right? These are all going to be the same. This carbon 
doesn't have any hydrogens. So that carbon won't show up in an NMR spectrum. That's the, the thing that, that gets tricky here is we're not talking, we're not, the number of signals doesn't tell you the number of chemically distinct carbons. It tells you the number of chemically distinct protons. If you have a carbon without a proton on it, it won't show up in a proton in NMR. So we have the blue ones, the red ones. The dark green. So even though both of these carbons are CH2s, they're different distances from the end of the chain versus in the carbonyl, right? And the carbonyl is not going to have hydrogen on it, so it won't show up either. So for the red ones, what is the integral going to look like? I guess which of these is going to have the smallest integral? Just the single hydrogen, the yellow one. What's it? So the integral should be about six times that for the red ones. But what is the peak splitting going to look like? What's the multiplicity for the red ones? Two peaks double. Yeah, just a doublet. It'll be a big doublet. It'll be wide because it's going to have an integral of six. That's just two peaks in that signal. Versus the yellow one, it's going to have a very small integral. And how many nearest neighbors does it have? Six. So how many peaks? What's the multiplicity? So multiplicity of seven. Right. So it'll look something like. The tops of the peaks should still be that nice bell curve shape, but they're going to be really, really narrow because the integral is so small. What's the multiplicity for the green one? Three. Multiplicity will be three as two nearest neighbors. So we a triplet because this carbon doesn't have anything on it. No protons, I mean. So it just has the two nearest neighbors from the purple protons. So we get something that looks like that for the green one. And that's very similar to what we'll see for the purple ones, right? Purple also only has two nearest neighbors because that, that quaternary carbon doesn't have any hydrogens on it. So how would we be able to tell the difference between the two CH2s? They both have a multiplicity of three and they both have an integral of two. It's going to be more shielded because it's closer to the carbonyl. Well, shielded or de shielded? Okay, de -shielded I mean. More de shielded. Yeah, we'd expect the green one to be further downfield because it's closer to the carbonyl. The carbonyl is electron withdrawing, it's more electronegative. So it's pulling electron density away from the carbon hydrogens. And then last but not least, the blue ones. You have the largest integral, right? Integral of nine. What's the multiplicity of that one? Three, or the nearest one is zero. Yeah. The nearest one is zero hydrogen, so it's just gonna be one peak. So you get a singlet with a really big integral. 
And a molecule like this, this would all, this would give us a pretty complicated NMR spectrum because the red peaks and the blue peaks and the purple peak are all going to be pretty close to each other. Remember, all of your methyl groups all showed up in about the same area. So you might wind up with, if you have really good resolution, you might be able to tell that it was two different signals um, and what the splitting looked like, but you might wind up with this one and this one on top of each other. So you might wind up with a mess down there below one that has an overall integral of 15. But again, that still tells you something, right? If you've got 15 of your of your protons, 15 of your 20 protons are all on top of each other, all more upfield than one. That means you've got a whole bunch of methyls, right? Because methyl is really the only thing that shows up all the way up there. And so sometimes, even when it's complicated or looks really nasty, don't try to do too much with it right away. What does this mess tell me? The mess itself tells you something. All right, so here's here's the way we start. This is sort of like I won't say training wheels, um, but it's sort of the the first step in being able to interpret these and go from a random NMR spectrum to the structure. Is I'm pretty sure this is the structure. Here's the NMR. Can I match all of my hydrogens to this to the right peaks? So it's almost turning it like multiple choice. So I'll give you two a few minutes. You can confer with each other as well. Is a total of. I guess I should I should define this as well. Um, it's I cut it off here, but occasionally there'll be a peak right at zero. Um, that's usually a marker molecule. It's the solvent that we use um, that has that shows up with one proton at a very specific at, at zero, and it's kind of we don't define zero. Only well, we define zero according to that peak. Um, but basically, it's if you see something right at zero, that's not going to be integrated. It's not part of your molecule. It's the solvent that your molecule is dissolved in. Is that sort of like a standard for the yeah. operation? Or? And I'm blanking on it because if it's, I want to say it's THF, which is tetrahydrofuran, but that should show up with two signals. So now I'm, no, it's, uh, yeah, let me double check what they use as the, as the standard while you're looking at this. It's not THF, it's TMS, which is tetramethyl silane, which is a silicon with four methyl groups attached to it. So they're all very, very shielded and show up at zero. All right, we have all of our information here, right? We have number of, number of peaks is not really going to be relevant, or number of, of signals. I keep saying peaks, but with the peak splitting, I shouldn't do that. Um, number of signals is not really that useful considering we already have our molecule. But shielding, integral, and peak splitting are all in this one, right? So which of these protons would you expect to be? Let's just start with the shielding first. <laughs> 
which of these protons would you expect to be most de-shielded? The hydrogen next to the chlorine. We said the hydrogen next to the chlorine. Be the most de-shielded. Does our splitting and integration match up with that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we have the smallest integral. Everything else, every other signal has <laughs> two protons in it, right? And it has five nearest neighbors. So we should expect to see a sextuplet here. And it does get a little tricky if you're not, if you don't have it right in front of you to draw on it. Um, when I give you printouts, I'm gonna to try to also zoom in on any of these where to make sure you can see the peak splitting as best you can. But yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we have all three of our pieces of evidence agree with that one. Where did you go next? Uh, on two hydrogens, I put it as the plus. As this one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah shielding, you might not be able to tell just based on the shielding, since both of these are one carbon away from the chlorine. But the integration, if nothing else, right? Because the other two options both should have an integration of three, and this set should have an integration of two. So, yeah, so find what's unique about the proton you're looking at or the peak you're looking at. And that, that definitely helps. And peak splitting matches, right? It has five or four nearest neighbors. And so we see a pentuplet. And CH2, secondary carbons, do tend to show up a little bit more downfield than methyl groups. Methyl groups at the end of a carbon chain tend to be the most shielded. So then out of our two methyl groups, once again, we can use the shielding as our primary decision maker. We know that they're both, they both have the same integration, so that's not going to be a deal breaker for us. But peak splitting could help us confirm what our what we think initially. Which one should be more downfield, more de-shielded? A lot closer to the yeah. One closer to the chlorine. And we do we see a doublet. Yep. So one nearest neighbor and it's more de-shielded both of which point towards um, that carbon on the left. Becky's saying hi. Becky wishes she was an OM. Yeah. <laughs> which process of elimination means that this the purple one is one on the other side, but again, we still want to double check that we didn't confuse anything. Peak splitting matches, integration matches, and the fact that it's the most shielded all agree, right? When you get one of the, your pieces of information that disagrees with the other two, you've got to find a way to reconcile that. Sometimes it's, well, it's the peak splitting. I can't trust the peak splitting. Or, well, maybe you know, there's resonance happening, and that can affect the shielding. Right? So sometimes there are other things going on that you're going to need to reconcile. They won't always agree this completely but there should at least be a decent explanation for it if they don't match. All right, this is our ethyl benzene. We already, we already worked through this one exhaustively. Um, but once again, our peak splitting matches up our aromatic region. Don't try to do too much when you've got a bunch of stuff, especially in the aromatic region. You can wind up with a bunch of stuff on top of it. So don't try to interpret too much into that. So in that case, the peak splitting is not as It definitely with aromatics, the peak splitting throws things off. Even if we go back to one where we could see the peak splitting a little bit in the aromatic, we can't necessarily trust it. Um, 
because they should all have the same number of nearest neighbors or close to it. And it, what you see more with aromatics is um, you can tell where the substitution is based on how many signals you get rather than what the peak splitting is. Peak splitting also falls apart when you have something with lone pairs. When you have something with lone pairs, the proton that's attached there, whether it's a nitrogen or an oxygen, doesn't always couple as well with the carbons nearby because the carbon's magnetic field is different than the nitrogen. And the electronic environment's a little different, so they don't couple as well. You don't get consistent um, peak splitting. It really works. Peak splitting really is most reliable when there's no resonance and when you only have um, carbons involved. As soon as one of those goes out the window, you shouldn't trust your peak splitting too much. All right, so let's do some IR and then we'll tie it together with some NMR. So you might not have your table of frequencies in front of you, but who remembers what, what are the four things we're supposed to look for in an IR? SP3, SP2. SP3 versus SP2. So that's that's our line right at 3,000, right? We only have things to the right of that. So lower energy carbon hydrogens, which means SP3. So we only have SP3 unless that's an aldehyde. So you can still circle it and label it, just leave it with a question mark. SP3CHs, no SP2CHs, no hydroxyl. And again, this doesn't necessarily mean that there's no SP2 carbons. Just that if you have SP2 carbons, they don't have hydrogen. It's just like a bond between the carbons and hydrogen. Exactly. Without looking, getting the table out, there's our last thing to look for, right? In that 1600 to 1700 to 18, maybe 1800 at the top high end is a carbonyl. And usually it's one peak by itself, pretty sharp, pretty strong. And really, that's that's how quickly we can look at an IR when you first look at it. We're not looking at what type of carbonyl this is yet. We're just like, is it there? Is it not? So if you had the aldehyde group, um, would both of those peaks show up in like the same group? Could it show peaks at two different locations since you're looking at the same group can show up with peaks in two different locations, but it'll be two different peaks. Okay. Like this one up here for the aldehyde, that's the carbon hydrogen. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the carbonyl bond. Okay, but carbonyl. Could, those two peaks could represent the if same. If it's group. an aldehyde, you should have both of those. If you have this one and that's not an aldehyde peak, maybe we have a different carbonyl. Maybe it's an ester or maybe it's a ketone or something. Okay. All right, so there's our formula. What else? Can we do anything else with it really at this point? Not a whole lot. We just keep track of it. And then we see if there's more information available. So if it is an aldehyde, the, the NMR should make that really, really obvious because the aldehydes showed up all the way down the field past 10 or around 10 at least. Carboxylic acids were at 13 or so. But the, the aldehydes showed up 
in a spot nothing else showed up in an animal. So if it is that formaldehyde, that should be really easy to see. But our furthest downfield peak is only just past four. So we go back and we cross off. And sometimes you might want to leave yourself a note why. No, because no. NMR. But basically, when you're interpreting these, you want to be able to look at them. This is one where having them printed back to back is not always helpful. And you kind of want some scratch paper too, but mark them up right on it. While you're looking at no, there's no aldehyde in a mark peak, so that's definitely not an aldehyde. We definitely do have a carbonyl, but it's not an aldehyde. We don't have an OH. So the fact that our formula has two oxygens in it, but we don't have an OH anywhere, means that maybe we're looking at an ester. It's either an ester or it's two ketones, right? This means something that has that has carbon oxygen double bonds, and we need to use two oxygens to do it, which is pretty suggestive of an ester, or that we have two ketones of some sort. I have potentially an ether. You could have an ether and a ketone. So it's an ester separate from itself, from the, the other part of it. So if then we get handed this, all of our carbons and hydrogens are sp3, all of our carbon hydrogen bonds are sp3. We've got some clean peak splitting. We have a total of one, two, three, four, five chemically distinct sets of protons, right? and six carbons. What does that tell us? One carbon, doesn't have a hydrogen on it. One carbon doesn't have a hydrogen on it. And it tells us we don't have a super symmetric molecule. We don't have anything where two of my carbons are identical to each other, right? One of my carbons is a carbonyl, which makes sense. A carbonyl shouldn't have a hydrogen on it unless it's an aldehyde, right? So, and we know we've got to probably have an ester group. And then we have some hydrogens on each side. Two distinct methyl groups from each other. Down here, one's significantly more deshielded than the other. This is when you would probably want to go back to your table of chemical shifts as well. So a lot of flipping back and forth, they're have, you know, having a whole bunch of sheets spread out. You can't, you can't overemphasize how nice it is to have empty space in front of you. Don't try to do this on a you know an airplane um, tray table. You have to be able to spread out so you can see these things. So four was our. Our highest peak was just past four. So where are the esters in here? Esters aren't really going to show up exactly because they don't have any hydrogens directly as part of it, right? We have something that's where you've got a carbon directly attached to an ether oxygen, which is probably going to be kind of similar to an ester. So let's go see. So basically, if we don't have anything in here specifically about esters. Okay, well, let's go back and, or was there anything about adjacent to a carbonyl on this one? There's the key, there's a ketone carbonyl. Should be in that two to 2.5 region. 
Well, there's one right there, and that two two point five region. We have one over here, significantly more deshielded, with peak splitting of four, multiplicity of four, so it has three nearest neighbors. It was the carbon directly attached to an oxygen that gave us that four region, right? And having three nearest neighbors hints at having a that you're adjacent to a methyl group. If you have, that's not the only way you have three nearest neighbors, right? But that's certainly a one way, probably the most common way to have three nearest neighbors is to be adjacent to a methyl group. And no nearest neighbor is the other direction. So there's three of our six. Our next most de shielded, this was the one that was adjacent to the carbonyl, was between the two and the 2.5, and it has two nearest neighbors. So what does that tell us about the other side of this molecule? What would be the simplest way we could put the rest of the molecule together? And I'll give you a tip. Sometimes you guys noticed how much easier it was with that bromobutane example to assign the peaks once you had the structure drawn, right? Try drawing the structure and see if you find anything that disagrees with it. And then try drawing another structure that fits the information you have. Usually there's gonna be some way of deciding between them but sometimes it's as simple as, well, we have three more carbons left. Simplest way we could attach them would just be three in a row, right? Is there anything in our NMR spectrum that would tell us that's wrong? So our carbon that's directly attached to the carbonyl, that should be our peak that shows up between 2 and 2.5. Peak splitting matches and the integration match. We haven't looked at the integration that much. Partly because I don't have a good ruler built in here. But eyeballing it. Looks like that to me. So an integral of two with multiplicity of three, so two nearest neighbors, is pretty indicative of a CH2 group next to another CH2. If this is right, we should have a CH2 group. And the, our other integral of two should be down in the secondary alkyl range, that one to two range. And it has five nearest neighbors. So should we should see a sextuplet, right? Mm -hmm. Which we do. So sometimes getting the structure on the paper and then seeing if you did anything wrong is easier. It's It's like a very, glorified guess and check in a lot of ways. Like, here's one possibility. Did I do it wrong? Maybe, maybe not. Let's find out. If there are two possibilities and you can't decide between them, 
that's when it gets dicey. You might go, we might go back to the IR, or we might start splitting hairs on the peak splitting, or just you pick one and say, I think this one is the best supported, and here's my reasoning, but here's the other possibility. So last thing, if we did this right, we should be able to assign each of these different peaks or each of these different signals to one of these carbons, right? So we're just number them from left to right, call this one. Oops. Signal one, two, three, four, five. Signal one, the most deshielded is this one, right? Peak splitting matches, integral matches, shielding matches. Number of peaks matches. We didn't even talk about that one yet, um, other than real generally at first. Peak two. One directly attached to the carbonyl. Three is our last CH2 group, right? It's the last one with an integral of three. Multiplicity of six, the right integral, the right shielding. Then we have our two methyl groups. How do we decide which is which? Yeah, we probably have to go with the shielding for this one. It's not a smoking gun, but we don't have a smoking gun, right? Multiplicity is the same, integration is the same. Probably the methyl group that is closer to the ether oxygen is going to be a little bit more de shielding. So the one on the on the right, the peak splitting would be different from this because no, because they're both adjacent to a CH two, and they both have the same integral. This is this is definitely one of those cases where our this is our best guess, but we only are going off of one piece of information, which is the shielding, and that's far from conclusive. Sometimes some and sometimes things, especially if resonance is involved. Shielding can do some funny stuff. That's not what we expected. So our best guess would be that this is five and that one's four. But at the very least, going through and assigning them at the end gives us a lot of confidence this is the right structure, right? And the only other, you know, it matches our formula, it matches our, our, our IR data. Most of the heavy lifting in this, though, is going to come from the NMR when it comes to the structures. The NMR basically, or the IR basically lets you rule out functional groups, but it doesn't tell you anything about how many methyls you have or how close your methyls are to something else, right? The IR has a ton of data and it's layered, so it takes some practice, which is why that's what we're going to do in lab. Maybe. I'm guessing this is going to be on the final. Um, for like four and five, would you want us to explain like the D shield or yeah. if we showed all that work, would it be kind of like, okay, like that's probably what they did? Yeah, this are most D shielded. So I would want some sort of explanation, but the way that we're doing this on that, on the, I actually had to work backward from the final on the closed book part where I say, here's a molecule, predict, give me a, a very qualitative drawing of what the NMR spectrum would look like. And it'd be something with only like three signals. I'm gonna be like, okay, here's my first signal. It's gonna have this multiplicity. So I'm gonna draw it like that. And I'm gonna put it in this spot on the, on the spectrum. I'm not gonna be able to ask you to do this on the closed book part. I mean, maybe at most, Give you the structure, and then ask you to assign peaks, and then in which case, yes, I would say I would want you to say when I was deciding between four and five, I was a little unsure, but I picked. You, know, you obviously don't have to do that for both, but um, I 
I said that four was the one that was more deshielded because it was closer to an oxygen. Would be enough argument for that one, and that would be a full credit answer. All right. We won't get into competing mechanisms today. I wanted to get through this and do some practice with these um, on the recording because I know Alexia is not going to make it for the lab either. And today's lab is going to be the, the write-up part of it. The analysis part is going to be doing this for the limonene and the eugenol. So I wanted to have this on the recording. So we'll be all set there. Um, I'll be... I will be in my office in setting up for lab. I have to make sure that our, I don't know if you all heard, but we had an issue over Thanksgiving break with the uh, the heating in the lab, um, which I think we got it under control, but we still need to make sure that the ice wash is thawed out because it was frozen, um, or the, the eye wash, not the ice wash, the eye wash um, has thawed out. So I'll be in lab trying to make sure we're good there. Um, if you if you need me office hours any questions anything like that otherwise see you at one.